I am Bill Weir from ABC News. Good morning, America Weekend, and uh, welcome to Illuminating the Abyss, the Unknown Ocean. Uh, this is uh, my second turn here at the World Science Festival. I'm so happy to be back. And uh, as luck would have it, when they offered me this particular panel, I, I leaped at the chance. Marine biology was my first major uh, because they were offering a uh, spring break trip to Jamaica. <laughs> And uh, I soon learned that uh, it was more microscopes and less red stripe, so I changed it to journalism, and perhaps the oceans are better for that. I don't know about uh, the state of journalism, but uh, thank you all for coming here. We have established an uh, amazing panel, uh, some of the leading luminaries and minds when, when we talk about the, the world's oceans. Uh, next week, uh, we'll mark World Oceans Day and talk about a significant uh, a milestone. It, it, these waters cover 70% of our planet, only 5% are mapped. We know more about Mars than we do about uh, the deep in our own backyard. 70% of the oxygen on this planet comes from our seas. Our, our very life depends on it, but 12 men have been to the moon, only two men have been to the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean in the Mariana Trench, and that was 50 years ago. So there is so much to learn, and so much to preserve, and when we first uh, formed this panel, we thought we'd do the gee whiz, the science, uh, the wonders of the unexplored, the importance of survival, but then, of course, uh, on April 20th, uh, all of that changed, and our focus turned to the Gulf of Mexico for all of the wrong reasons. Uh, so we will include a good discussion on the Deepwater Horizon disaster and what is ahead, as a result of the worst uh, environmental catastrophe in this nation's history. But uh, let's just get things started and bring out the, the people you came to see. We'll start with a, a senior fellow at the Ocean Foundation. He directs uh, uh, an amazing program on the coral reefs of Cuba. And when you see the video, it's, it's amazing how pristine these reefs are compared to those in the Keys just a few miles away. His current work uh, focuses on that, also migratory sea turtles in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, please welcome Dr. David Guggenheim. Uh, our next panelist is director of special projects at uh, the revered Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. He was one of the first oceanographers to use a combination of submarines and robots to map the undersea world. And he is an entertaining guy, regardless of what he's talking about, Dr. David Gallo. Uh, our next panelist is uh, synonymous with ocean exploration and, and a passion for the seas. She's an explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society, former chief scientist at the National Ocean Atmospheric Association, NOAA as it's more commonly known, and she's spent decades investigating deep water ecosystems, developing new technologies for exploration. She's been referred to as her deepness, uh, Dr. <laughs> Sylvia Earle. And uh, our next panelist has a name that uh, inspired me, uh, among others, to, uh, to take an interest in the ocean. And he is a writer and documentary filmmaker, ocean explorer, and a third generation of probably the most famous name in this business, uh, a pioneering adventurer, grandfather uh, Jacques Cousteau. And he will start us off with a tribute uh, to his grandpa, Fabien Cousteau. Everybody, welcome. <laughs> I couldn't hear what lies were spun back there, but uh, I hope they were good. <laughs> wow, I am honored to be here with all of you and our ocean heroes, not only to get out of the uh, heat, but also uh, as a mark of the 100th birthday commemoration for my grandfather, Jacques Cousteau. Today, we still know much more about outer space than we do about our own ocean world. Yet, before an astronaut steps into space, he or she must first step into water. With camera in hand, over five for over five decades, my grandfather shared his adventures, his passion, and his concerns for the liquid abyss with hundreds of millions of people around the world. 
But many don't know that he also helped invent the tools that broke the bonds chaining man to the surface, to water's surface. In 1943, off the coast of the French Riviera, my grandfather, a naval officer at the time, conducted a series of experiments that would redefine the boundaries of exploration. He was testing a breathing regulator he had invented with engineer Emile Gagnon's help, the key component of the Aqualung. Better known as scuba, this new equipment would allow divers to breathe underwater for the first time without connection to the world above, allowing them to plunge greater, darker depths for extended periods of time. No longer tethered to the surface, he gave man the freedom of flight. With this, my grandfather unlocked the doors to the silent world. Uh, throughout the program, we're going to talk about how these and others have, are taking that legacy on into the future. But we must uh, start the program, I think, with the news of the day. And I'm sure your grandfather would be uh, weeping uh, seeing what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico. It's day 46 of the BP uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster. Uh, Thad Allen of the Coast Guard said that they have been successful, relatively successful in, in capping the riser after they used the giant tin snips to, to, to cut off the top. But we're just now being able to see the extent of the damage to life, uh, the turtles, the pelicans we've been fixated on. But the, here, since we're talking about the abyss, uh, we really want to get into what's happening beneath the surface, uh, Dr. Earl, and not only with the oil, but the dispersants. Over, I think, 1.8 million gallons of chemicals have been dumped onto and around this spill. What is that doing to the microscopic life and everything else that lives down there? I wish we had a straight answer to that straight question. The fact is, we don't know, and that's inexcusable. We should not be pouring toxic materials into the sea with, without knowing the consequences. All we know is it makes it look as though the oil has gone away. But not only has the oil not gone away, it's just broken up into smaller pieces, but you've added to it, as you point out, more than, well, close to out now to two million gallons yeah. of materials that are not found in nature. At least oil is damaging as it is in many ways is found in nature, and there are microbes that chew away at the oil, ultimately. When I was the chief scientist at NOAA, looking at the aftermath of the Exxon Valdez spill, all of those sincere efforts to steam clean the rocks actually cooked the organisms that might have been the sources of renewal. And I had the unhappy job of reporting to the public after a, a year later that in fact, those places that had not been treated were recovering faster than those where we thought we were doing the right thing. Now, with these dispersants, I can see if there is a, a flow that is approaching a marsh or a critical rookery where obvious damage is going to be done by an avalanche of oil. Okay, you make trade-offs. Some things die, but other things might live, and it's a judgment call. And we can make that call in some cases with some degree of, of feeling that we're making the right decision. But when you broadcast just thousands of gallons of these toxic materials and thus not only do exactly the opposite of what you want to do, which is gather the oil, collect it, get rid of it, you disperse it through a much wider area and much deeper than it. I mean, oil tends to float, mm -hmm. although I've seen plenty of evidence in the Persian Gulf, when again, as chief scientist, I was over looking at the aftermath of that humongous, deliberate spill. And oil does sink naturally. Not, I mean, generally, the mass of it tends to be at the surface. And you can collect it at the surface using various techniques. But once it's split up into gazillions of little pieces, how are you going to get it back? Yeah, you know? we, we have some video. This was actually shot by a colleague of mine, Sam Champion at Good Morning America. So you get a sense of what the, what the oil and the dispersants look like under there. And your old home, NOAA, they put together a panel of 50 experts and uh, they just announced that 
it is the lesser of two evils. You say they made a value call there. One of the, one of the men at NOAA said that the chemicals under, the animals harmed by the chemicals underwater have a better chance of rebounding quickly than the birds and mammals uh, on the shoreline. Gentlemen, your thoughts, and Dr. Still Earl? <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, well, Dave, go on, why don't you? Well, I mean, it is very much a trade-off, and I think one of the most neglected parts of the entire Gulf ecosystem are the parts that we just don't see, yeah. the parts deep down under. And even at 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet, 5,000 feet, there's life, and really incredible life. And these dispersants are, as Sylvia put it, broadcasting this spill into a much broader area, and it's likely to impact those critters that we just can't see uh, much with much greater uh, effect. Yeah. In addition to this, and, and Dr. Gallo, you can speak to this. You know, you look at this and you think, all right, this is the part in the movie where Bruce Willis <laughs> is taken into a, a secret room at the Pentagon and they show him the really super submarine that sure. can go down and fix this yeah. thing. You were part of a panel along with James Cameron, who knows right. a little something about movie submarines. Sure. Why can't they fix a leaky pipe at the bottom I mean, of the ocean? It, it, it's enraging in a lot of ways. One, that you know, we have this, uh, we can drive a robot around the surface of Mars and we can't fix a leaky pipe in our own backyard. It's, it's insane. Uh, two is that we have to do what we said, we have to uh, take a gamble on this person. So, you know, there's so much at stake, and we know so little about the science, we don't even know yet what's at stake. Uh, but it could, be, it could be really dramatic. The technologies uh, to go, this happened at about a mile deep uh, where the well is, and uh, there aren't a lot of technologies to get us there. The oil company has got the kinds of robots that we need uh, to uh, drill for oil and to complete those drilling locations. Once the oil gets into the water, it's a different story, though. It's the job, really, of observing where the oil's going, measuring fates and effects and all that. And uh, can, can we show, uh, I have a picture of the submarine Elvin, which is the only deep submersible submarine. There's Elvin, takes three people down to the bottom. Goes deeper than the oil spill, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's not something that we would use in the Gulf necessarily, but we need that kind of technology, the human presence to see we what's going on. We have a fleet on. of one. We have a fleet of one, and it's old. You know, we need a new one. So a fleet of one, yep. <laughs> Uh, we've got robots. If you could roll the uh, video, uh, we're going to see a robot called Abe. And uh, we can put robots in the water. Uh, but again, you know, it's, it's, we're 40 some odd days into this and we're just now able to respond, the academic community, because there are so few of these uh, technologies out there that some of them are in the Pacific, some of them are in the Atlantic, the Antarctic. So getting them all together, getting a ship, it's really horrible um, as a society that uh, we are, we're caught in this situation. Let's look at some of what's actually down there in the Gulf under the surface. I think there's a little video of that as well. And think about this. The Coast Guard, NOAA, other government agencies have aircraft. You can fly over the ocean. You have ocean, they have ships, like lots of ships, billions of dollars invested in above and at the surface. But what do we have to take us beneath the surface where the action is, where the life is? This is one of the few little vehicles that only goes to 2,000 feet, not even halfway to where the source of this spill is. And one, one one hundredth of the investments in outer space are, are given to ocean exploration. That's right. And there's a perception that, that there's a dead zone in the Gulf because of all the f fertilizers that come down the Mississippi. There's a dead zone in our heads. <laughs> <laughs> but this is proof of, uh, of the contrary. So much life is there. And then f f as we think about where the currents will take this oil, oh, up it, the Atlantic, over to Europe? Well, yeah. it's, it's an it's a absolute nightmare because, you know, think of, of making a vinaigrette and then shaking it up and then putting it into uh, a water system that's, that's got currents and everything else. It not only is going to be in the Gulf, it's, it's going to go It's filled with life. It, it's yeah. filled with life. And it's, yeah, it's going to affect life all the way up the, the uh, Gulf Stream into Europe. It, it doesn't affect just that one local area. In, in fact, people tend to think of the Gulf of Mexico as this sort of brown, murky body of water. And, <laughs> and I have never seen water more clear than in the Gulf of Mexico on an expedition with Sylvia. Mm -hmm. I was in that submarine at almost 300 feet stretching and I looked up through the dome and could see waves breaking all the way on the surface. Amazing. But to answer your question about where this oil is going, two days ago, uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research released the results of one of their models. Um, 
and showed with virtual certainty that this spill is headed south to Cuba, across the Florida Keys, and up the east coast of the United States uh, along the eastern seaboard, and then back to the UK to BP headquarters, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I am very concerned about what lies to the south. I've been lucky enough to spend the last decade of my life working in Cuba because Cuba is that hot tub time machine that we've dreamed about. It is like going back to the time of Christopher Columbus to see what those ecosystems looked like 500 years ago. I think we have some video of um, some corals in Cuba uh, and just how well preserved these ecosystems are. And uh, one, of the, one of the purposes of this research, like this Elkhorn coral, which you just don't see anymore, and predator-dominated ecosystems, these huge grouper, Nassau grouper, which are um, on the endangered species list, I lost track of, and lots of very friendly sharks. <laughs> uh, the, the concern is we were looking to Cuba to solve our own problems, looking to learn from why are their reefs so healthy while in the rest of the Caribbean and the world reefs are dying. 25% of the world's coral reefs have basically died with another 25% destined to die in the next couple of decades. 25% of the fish in the ocean depend on coral reefs. 500 million people depend on coral reefs. It's just, it just goes on and on and what a tragedy this would be. If, if the Gulf were just a, a dead zone, uh, the endangered bluefin tuna wouldn't go thousands of miles into the Gulf to spawn. I mean, this is an absolute beautiful fireworks display of life down there that's being threatened. You talked about um, you are uh, handcuffed in so many ways in terms of resources, but what can science do? Uh, you know, I, we've been, I've been reading for years about bioremediation, the microbes you talked about. I, I learned this week that microbes these little, little bugs eat the equivalent of two Exxon Valdez spills a year in the Gulf that just occur naturally out of the earth. Is there a way to freeze dry them, spray them on the, you know, I mean, what? Well, we shouldn't poison them for heaven's sake. Yeah, we should, I guess we should. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that we've learned the last 50 years, it's safe to say, wouldn't you say that we've learned more about the ocean than during all preceding human history? About the time that your grandfather really began to look beneath the surface, so were other individuals, the science of, of knowing plate tectonics, about continental drift, about understanding that from the surface to the greatest depth, there's life. And the diversity of life is in the ocean. All the major divisions of life basically are there, and only about half occur on the land. So what we've learned basically, though, is that the ocean drives climate and weather, generates maybe 70% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. You talk about microbes, there's one little blue-green bacterium that accounts, according to Penny Chisholm at MIT, who, with her colleagues, discovered this little blue-green beast. One, the oxygen, and one in every five breaths you take. About 20% of the oxygen uh -huh. comes from this one kind of blue-green bacterium. And we didn't even know of its existence when your grandfather started diving, when I started diving, for heaven's sakes. We now know that unless we take care of the ocean, nothing else really matters because the ocean keeps us alive. And it isn't just about microbes to gobble up accidents that we generate. It's microbes and all the rest of life in the ocean and on the land as well, the natural systems that we, we have just marched through them, consuming the assets, thinking that there didn't matter what we did to the natural world, that it was so resilient, so abundant, that we could get away with it, but now we know, A, that we have the power to destroy and change the nature of nature, and B, that's not good news for us. Well, we've, we've treated our oceans like an infinite resource in a garbage can, yeah. and we're now faced with some dire consequences of that, but the good news is, at least, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I think that human beings can pull off miracles if they want to and if they're pressed to. But we really need to pull together to be able to do that. Yeah, in that meeting you mentioned, Bill, with uh, Jim, Jim Cameron, I mean, some people in the media made a, a lot of fun about it. Uh, 
I think people that are familiar with uh, Cameron's history uh, in terms of, um, he, sure he made the Abyss, Terminator, Titanic, and all these, uh, Avatar, all these wonderful movies. Uh, but his passion is the sea, and he's, a remar he's got a remarkable brain in terms of ocean uh, technology. He did stuff on Titanic. Woods Hole, uh, our laboratory, our teams found Titanic. Jim went back, here's a filmmaker, and did things on that ship going inside uh, in, a, in a way that we could never dream about because of his brain. And At he studied the, marine biology. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's just amazing. So, I, you know, I think in, in one swell, in one just moment, uh, the uh, media managed to insult a whole bunch of us. Because <laughs> he, he was able to pull together, and he didn't make a big deal out of it, there was no press release. Uh, he had people from the government, NOAA, Coast Guard, uh, Woods Hole, so there were academics there, Harbor Branch, but there were also people from industry, small business, uh, you, you had friends there that were involved, and so did you. Uh, but the idea was let's brainstorm, to go back to that question, what would we have do we done do? differently? Yeah. Uh, and what can we do right. in the future? And you know, in terms of what BP is doing, at this point, you know, what, what we hope they do is not make things worse. And, and that, that can happen. You can actually make things worse. By, and, and that's meant to have, when you see stuff still leaking, that's meant to be that way. Well, the, the second part is to get ready for what might be coming next. Let's identify, let's get ahead of the curve. Identify what places might be threats next, and let's put in place the rapid response so it doesn't take months to respond to one of these events next time. Drilling is already taking place in twice as the depth yeah. right now yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it's scary stuff. This is pretty threatening to, as, as Sylvia has beaten into my head over the <laughs> last couple of years. I mean, we, if we kill the oceans, we kill ourselves. Dr. Gugan. And, and, and this is, um, these sorts of meetings and, and brainstormings, these should have happened two decades ago at least. And it's, it's our own arrogance that has led us result in the New York Times article put it best is you, know, you call 911 because your house is on fire and your fire department has to figure out how to build a fire truck. I mean, we shouldn't exactly be in right. this situation exactly right. um, at, at all. The, the problem, uh, going back to your original question about these bacteria, um, you know, every time we tinker with nature, we're, we're in for surprises and very often they're unpleasant surprises and, and we have to proceed with caution. One of the strangest jobs I ever had was serving as a consultant for Biosphere 2. You remember when they locked those guys inside for two years and they all got really skinny uh, because everything died inside and oxygen levels plummeted, carbon dioxide levels got to near toxic levels and the only things that did really well in the end were cockroaches and ants, right. and they weren't even <laughs> supposed to be there. <laughs> and and this, this was all taking place in, in an environment that we supposedly had complete control over. That's a pretty humbling lesson for Biosphere One, which is planet Earth. And so when I hear solutions like that, I applaud the creativity, but we proceed at our own risk. I mean, we're, we're you know, there is no planet B. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, until we get off our addiction of oil uh, and other fossil fuels and move to more sustainable options, and there are plenty of them out there. Uh, you know, we're it's not a matter of if, but when this happens again. There are over 9,000 platforms in and around the United States. So it's, it's playing Russian roulette. It takes leadership and, and enforcement as well. But in talking about ideas, we were discussing before the panel the, the incredible political pressure there will be once this thing is capped, whether it's the relief well or whatever stops it, to reopen those fishing waters in the Gulf. And so you've already got a hugely stressed region. You say that, you know, the livelihood of these people, but there'll be nothing for them to catch. So it doesn't do the fishermen any good, it doesn't do the ecosystem. And you proposed aquaculture, which is, has its detractors, the way it's done mm -hmm. in the open oceans, but on land, warehouses yeah. full of giant tanks, so maybe all of these Gulf crabbers and fishermen could work there. Is that what you think? Yeah, and what I'm proposing is next generation aquaculture. Aquaculture has a bad name because it earned it. Uh, the, the way we practice it, uh, by putting fish in open net pens, in open waters, is, is not so good. It pollutes the water. We have escapement of fish. In British Columbia, they're growing Atlantic salmon instead of Pacific Carnivores. salmon, which are escaping. <laughs> what I'm talking about are land-based systems. They look like a warehouse from the outside. They recirculate all of their water. No discharge, no chemicals or antibiotics, and more they grow more crop per drop. More crop per drop. Ooh, very, I, very I like efficient that. systems. <laughs> They've taken off, and they're highly profitable in Europe 
and in Asia and Australia, the Americas are very much behind. But I look to the Gulf region as a logical place for this because here you could keep the Gulf region in the seafood business, but create a whole sustainable industry. Uh, and instead of being public aid, it's a public investment in a new future. Another aspect of that is, yes, let's think about the livelihoods of the fishermen, but what about the, the livelihoods of the fish? Already okay. depressed, we need to hold on to those areas that are currently being put off limits to fishing to look at identifying, for example, where the, the tunas are spawning and protect it. The last thing we want to do is kill the tunas when they're making more tunas, if you want to have tunas in the future. But right now, we are killing them when they are amassed to spawn. We need to protect that area and uh, around the Gulf, find those places that can serve as sources of renewal. The plans were in place 10 years ago, something called Islands in the Stream, identifying critical places uh, like the Flower Garden Banks, a really small place mm -hmm. that is part of the National Marine Sanctuary System. But to really magnify that, not just in US waters, but including Mexico and Cuba, because mm -hmm. it is a trinational treasure, if you will. Right. And, and, and in the deep water, where presently no fishing is taking place, let's go out there and embrace these special deep coral reefs where corals may be absolutely. thousands of years old and before trawls get to them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and we're delighted, all of us, that Teddy Roosevelt had that vision to, to ult what ultimately led to the national park system to set aside land so that they could, you know, nature could do its thing un unimpeded. And, um, and we just have not done that in the oceans at all. Uh, on land, we've managed to set aside maybe 15%, depending how you measure it, of our lands in some form of protection. In the water, it's, it's been under a percent. And until recently, it was less than a tenth of a percent. You can pretty much do as you please in our, in our oceans. That, that video I showed of Cuba, part of that was taken in the largest protected area in the Caribbean, almost 1,000 square miles. It's been that way for 13 years. And to see big grouper, bigger than I am, uh, and big sharks, Didn't and you can the just, jello? yeah. <laughs> but, not touching that. <laughs> um, the Brotherhood of David has yeah, to stick together. A little it's marine biology together. ribbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but all you've got to do, to know whether these protected areas work, all you've got to do is stick your head underwater for five minutes in one of these areas. Yeah. You should uh, all do that. Yes. <laughs> all of you. You're invited. Oh. Well, let's, let's pivot to that, because you know we, we've talked about the dire, so let's talk about potential. Let's talk about possibility. And I, I'll alert the control room. We want to roll the next clip from the behind the scenes. Have you seen the film Oceans? It's still in theaters now. Uh, Jacques Perrin uh, continued the tradition of your grandfather taking cameras where places that no one has ever seen before. And this maybe gives enough of the public a glimpse as to what's down there. It can, you know, sort of capture their minds and think about what's possible, and then we'll get into other possible exploration ideas. But here's a little look at the behind the scenes of the making of oceans. They had tools that your grandfather didn't have. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oceans. How do you get a fresh look at the ocean? How do you get closer to wildlife and their natural habitat? How do you show species like they've never been shown before? It takes time and a whole series of new tools developed specifically to capture this dynamic world at the surface and underwater in order to become a fish among fish. For four years, Jacques Perrin and Jacques Clouseau led Galate crews to the four corners of the earth to meet with denizen of the deep. film dolphins swimming toward the audience, we conceived and constructed a camera we call Jonas. Shaped like a torpedo, it is mounted at the rear of a boat, which can drag it at speeds up to 12 knots. 
after four separate dolphin shoots, Jonas proved every bit as satisfying with tuna. Underwater travel shots were accomplished using a pole cam, especially developed to follow and precede dolphins at high speeds. Equipped with a 35mm, 5-pound mini-cam, the mini-chopper was the best way to get aerial tracking shots undisturbed by the wake of a boat. All these tools, specifically developed for oceans, got us closer to the animals and their dynamic behaviors. making us a fish among fish. Yeah, if you haven't seen that. <laughs> I was sensing it, some serious gadget envy up here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. And Amazing. if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. This is the oceans at, at its best and the way it should be. Um, it, it, seeing it again is, is, I mean, it gets me, I want to get wet. Well, <laughs> I, and I, I talked to Jacques Perrin, and I, I said, and now you have to go deep. <laughs> right. Right. And he said, yes. But it is difficult. <laughs> well, what we, are the, what are the emerging? Uh, yes, I know yeah. exactly right. What are the emerging technologies? What's the most exciting developments in going down deep, as you say? Oh, it exists. We just have to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the yeah, technology. Yeah, that's the frustrating thing. We just yeah. need to get get going. Uh, one, I hope you all up, out there understand that there's a certain uh, hope that we all have because we know we can get ourselves out of the mess we got ourselves into. If we pull together with yeah. some leadership, we can do it. In the deep ocean, technology is important. You can't get there without technology. We're talking average depth of the ocean is about two miles. And the deepest depth is about seven miles. When you see a jet with a vapor trail behind it, that's seven miles. That's a lot of water to get to the bottom of. And as a, you know, I, I guess you want me to talk a little bit about what we see in the deep right now, or do you want to? I do, I do, I do. Want, before we get to that, though, you want to show this exosuit, which I think oh, is right out of. I do, yeah. I, I um, and, and <laughs> it's Buck Rogers stuff. Fun Underwater. stuff. This, this is, is Iron Man 3. <laughs> Iron Man talking Guggenheim. about Iron Man. <laughs> this, 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 this totally beats Iron Man. I've been, because <laughs> this, this is awesome, real. <laughs> this is real. Yeah. Um, I, I've been traveling to all 50 states uh, after I turned 50, talking to kids, trying to get them excited about the oceans and, uh, and science. And when I grew up, it was the space program, and I had pictures of all the Gemini and Apollo astronauts on my wall, and I watched Jacques Cousteau's episodes. I was tearing up watching that uh, just before. So I'm the product of that era. And we need that now for the future generations. So this is something I include in all of my presentations. Phil Newton up in Vancouver, the same guy who built the submarines that Sylvia and I have been out on expeditions with, which Sylvia says are so easy, even a scientist can use it. <laughs> it's true. Thanks. Um, this is called the exosuit. It's the next generation of pressure suits, of deep diving suits. Now, Sylvia, went down to 1,000 feet in, was 1250. it? 1250, yep. Uh, what Plus was it? Minus I want to get it right. 1250? <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, she went deep in a, in a similar suit. This is a one atmosphere suit, which means you are at the same pressure underwater as you would be at the surface, but it's basically a wearable submarine. So imagine getting up in the morning you have your coffee, you put your submarine on, you dive down to 2,000 feet, which is how far this will go, untethered, 
And the best part is there's a jet pack on your back so you can fly like Iron Man wow. <laughs> underwater. But the <laughs> disadvantage is, <laughs> no, but 2,000 feet, that's still the skin of the surface exactly. of the ocean. We're still talking about 35,000 feet, and we need to get to full ocean depth. I think it's scandalous that here we are, this far into the 21st century, and we still cannot sure. personally go. It was 50 years ago that the mm -hmm. one and only trip to the deepest part of the ocean was made with human beings. Now, Woods Hole has this wonderful one robot, robot device. One robot, one. and mm -hmm. Japan had one. Mm -hmm. And how far are we away from the, uh, the, that suit? in terms of being practical? Probably a year. Really? Yeah, oh, the, there's a prototype being built. Uh, it's just getting Phil, who's a busy guy, to finish to it. it. Yeah. Um, well, Dr. Gallo, tell us what's down there. You've mapped uh, what's yeah. under the, the skin, uh, as she said. <laughs> well, uh, it was a picture, a hand-drawn picture of the deep sea that got me involved in this. It was in National Geographic magazine back in the mid-70s, uh, because I thought the bottom of the seas were flat and covered with mud. The books that'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And uh, I'll, let me show you an image that I think might stun you. Uh, it's, a, it's a little pool of water. You see, the, you see the water there in the foreground? And there's a cliff on the right. It's been notched away at the bottom. And there's some rocks on the left. And you see ripples and the, the white sand in the back. Uh, just like a scene of a little pool of water at nighttime. That's at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, it's an underwater uh, pool. There's also underwater lakes that are... There's salt domes. There's, yep, there's super salty water, so it's a super salty lake. But look at that. At, at, it's at the bottom of the sea. Uh, so we find lakes at the bottom of the sea, we find rivers at the bottom of the sea, we find underwater waterfalls, we find the greatest... Actually, can we have the map of the world, the Heezen and Tharp map? This is done by Bruce Heezen and Marie Tharp, who only died very recently. But this map here, uh, Mostly artistic, but look at the oceans. If you strip the water away, 70% uh, of the planet covered with oceans. Strip it away, and you see some of the most dramatic topography on the planet. A mountain range that winds all around the world like the seams of a baseball. Uh, thousands of peaks on top of that mountain range that are many times higher than the Alps. Tens of thousands of valleys that crisscross it, many times wider and deeper than the Grand Canyon. Uh, underwater lakes, waterfalls. The largest waterfall on the planet is not Angel Falls, which is a half a mile up and down. It's five times that off the west coast of Iceland, a place called the Denmark Straits, where water pours from the Arctic, very dense water, down into the Atlantic Basin. So all of that in this world that, where we've only explored a few percent. Uh, when we go to that mountain range, can we have the volcanic eruption, please? We know every single day at the bottom of the sea, we have eruptions going on. There we go. This is what it looks like at the bottom of the sea. And in places. In places, <laughs> yep, yep, yeah, the very deep sea. This is very deep coupled from the world that we know. So this is the ocean floor being born, just like volcanoes on land. But we were stunned to only recently find out, this is done with a robot, to be able to see that kind of activity at the bottom of the ocean. So you'll see actually big fireballs of, coming from the lava, gas erupting at the bottom. Uh, that happens all along the top of that underwater mountain range. Now can we go to the next one, the uh, vents, please? The other thing we thought is that when we were so deep in the ocean, on top of this underwater mountain range, that there's these hot vents up there. And we thought for sure, being this deep, at a depth where the pressure is as great, that it would crush the Titanic the same way you could crush an empty paper cup with your hand, uh, that we would never find any life down here at all. And in, in fact, what we find is stunning. We find in terms of diversity and density, in a world we said there should be no life at all, life that actually rivals the tropical rainforest. In, in this one spot here, there were 200, uh, 300 species of animals. You see crabs there, clams. Those long things with the red tips and white tubes are called tube worms. They're like half plant, half animal. They're very bizarre animals. But we find uh, uh, in one spot of the 300 species about 297 never seen before. There's shrimp there and those shrimp have got, in fact, they're right, the hot water can get up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot water coming out of the it's ocean. It's a shrimp boil. It's a shrimp <laughs> you can't boil. No. You can't boil shrimp. So, so here's the deal. We were wrong. We're wrong about life on Earth. You know, in one instance of our exploring the deep ocean, in one instant of fight, in the one instant of finding that much life at the bottom of the Earth, we totally changed the way we look at life on this planet and other other planets in the solar system. So, planet. what else is out and, there, David? And I uh, still remember my <laughs> high school teacher and people in my generation being taught and taught, said, "David, life cannot exist on this planet without the sun." Well, these guys look like they're doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, they're thriving. <laughs> there is one thing that life on this planet cannot exist without. That's water, yep. mm -hmm. or That's anywhere right. in the universe. That's Ask right. the NASA guys who are looking for life elsewhere in the universe. What are they looking That's for? Right. 
Water. Yeah. Water. Yeah. Well, and so just imagine Earth without water. What have you got? Have we got that image of what Earth would look like without its water? Somewhere up there? Yeah, that was. <laughs> it's the Earth water image? Yeah, there, there you go. There we go. This is the, uh, oh, you know, we, we talk about the ocean planet being the blue marble. And Edward, so we, just, we said, let's, let's take all the water off the Earth. Because, you know, on this planet right now today, there's two and a half billion people that don't have adequate fresh water. And we thought, how can that be on this water planet? Uh, the ball on the right is all the water on Earth, the big, so if you have a basketball, all the water on Earth, if you pulled it off the Earth-sized basketball, would fit into a ping pong ball. The little speck on the right, it's actually smaller than that, that's all the fresh water there is. That stuff's precious. I mean, the big ball is precious, the ping pong-sized ball, but the fresh water, that little sprig for us to live the way we do, that's got to go in the right places, at the right time, at the right, at the right uh, amounts, uh, or else we collapse as a species. So, Sylvia, you're actually absolutely right. This mm -hmm. is a planet without very much water on it at all. Precious well, stuff. And if you take that ping pong ball, I mean, that's 99% of the world's total living space. Good point. That's right. Life needs water. <laughs> Where is there <laughs> life? Look for the water yeah. on this planet or any other. Yep. Let's yeah. talk about uh, what lives in that water. Um, luckily, I just got an assignment uh, from Nightline that allows me to at least have some kind of show and tell. That's commensurate with this esteemed panel, but take a look at this. This is uh, a pl <laughs> off the coast of the Philippines, and for 24 American dollars, they will take you out all day on an outrigger boat, and a guide will take you in with your snorkel and your fins, and it will say, right there <laughs> is a whale shark. Look at that. It's the uh, biggest fish I in the ocean, and uh, this, the popularity of these magnificent creatures has uh, raised the, the uh, economy of this little town, and now they're wrestling with how to balance people who are loving these things uh, too much. They're, they're, the, they're the most lovable creatures with the scariest name, whale sharks. They don't even, their teeth are like grains of rice. They only eat krill. They, they could gum you to death. They could gum you, yeah. yeah. I almost Especially very, if you're this big. You're right, yeah, I almost got hovered right into one of these things. That was one of the smaller ones. But, but what struck me is that we know so little about the biggest fish in the sea. Your, your grandfather only had two encounters with these. They're extraordinarily rare. Extraordinarily rare. We don't know where they migrate. They've just found the, 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 the smallest juvenile, so they, there's so little we know. But you're all yep. working in a ch on, a, on, on sort of a census to fix that. But do you know where one of the largest populations has yeah. just been discovered in the last few years? The Gulf of Mexico, off, mm -hmm. off the coast of Yucatan. Surprise, yeah. Is that right? Uh, and, and one day, and Cuba. And they go they in the straits between Cuba exactly. and Yucatan. In a single day, in an aerial survey, they found more than a thousand whale sharks. I mean, it's. <laughs> They've probably been doing this for thousands of years, but we didn't know about it. We just yeah. weren't there when they were there. They're and there it, right now, right now, this summer. And well, it, of course, in Japan, they're known as the tofu fish because the consistency of mm. the meat, uh, uh, you know, that leads you into a whole other discussion. And, well, yeah, talk about finny. shark fin soup. Yeah. That's a shark fin. Anyone fin says is. sustainable fisheries, and I'm moving away from Sylvia quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I made that mistake already. Yeah, right. Finning yeah. is a huge problem for sharks. Actually, yeah. can you that's mention, what's going to make can you, them all go oh, oh, so Can you just say a couple words about this? Because a lot of people do believe that. Right. Well, think of how many songbirds it would take to have sustainable extraction of wildlife from the land. It's how our ancestors used to make a living. We used to be hunters and gatherers, and it's still in our bones, I suppose, to go out and capture wildlife to, to dine upon. But we've gotten away from it on the land for a good reason. We sort of did them in. It took us about 10,000 years to do what my heroes and hero here at this conference, Ed Wilson, calls the large, the slow, and the tasty. <laughs> you know, we mowed them down. And so we grow most of the, of the calories that we consume. About half of the calories that feed all of the world come from corn, rice, and wheat. And about 100 other plants make up much of the rest. But we still attack the ocean as hunter-gatherers. And we have the, still this belief that it's somehow sustainable, that we can get the numbers right, despite the fact that within the last 50 years, we've seen a collapse of wildlife in the sea. And I don't think of it as seafood. Call it wildlife, because that's what it is. The tunas, the swordfish, the, the grouper, the snapper, the cod, the halibut, 
What do you like to eat? The wild salmon. Sea bass. Sea bass. Oh, Chilean sea bass. <laughs> Orange roughy. They may be 200 <laughs> years old. And in 20 minutes, you can do in a plate of orange roughy, but they live among corals that may be 2,000 years old. Well, that, that was and what I wanted to destroyed while you scoop up the orange roughy. Talk about, now this will drive the control room completely crazy, but there is a, 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 an image in there somewhere, a video of some corals in the Bering Sea. Um, one of the problems, let me talk about squirrels. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to stall for Wait, the Wait, there are squirrels room. in the ocean too. <laughs> Squirrel okay, fish. this is this is a thousand That's feet. Time. Good, good, good going control room. A uh, thousand feet below the surface in the Bering Sea, and surprise, corals. There Old are corals. cold water corals. This is beneath the deadliest catch, everybody. This is the same same waters. These are corals as well, and where you see corals, you see fish because. These and deep water corals are every bit as important as, as the basis of that ecosystem um, as they are in the shallower waters that we're accustomed to. Thank you. And here's the thing. If we wanted to catch a squirrel today, we could hire a little plane and fly through Brooklyn dragging a net, and we'd probably catch a couple squirrels along with some pedestrians and a couple <laughs> bicycles and a few lawsuits. It'd be an absolutely idiotic thing to do. But that's what we're doing in the oceans. The clear we cutters are of the ocean. clear cutting yeah. the ocean. And those corals, we were up there, I was up there with Greenpeace because these trawlers that are going through are dragging the bottom and scraping it clean of those corals that you just saw. And corals are incredibly slow growing animals and they are also the longest lived animals on the planet. Now, hold on to your seats. They can live and still be alive at the ripe old age of 4,000 years and just be gone in the blink of an eye. So when it's not just that we're overfishing, it's that we're trashing the very ecosystem where these fish come from. And it keeps us alive too. That's I, right. I sometimes get this brainwave thought about how you know what? We're all sea creatures. We're all as dependent on the ocean as the grouper, the corals, the kelp forests, because without the ocean, we can't survive either. If we trash the ocean, we're trashing our own life support system. And, they, and, it, and, and the life down there may hold keys to things that could cure cancer, that could help they us in so many keys. other ways. They do hold the keys. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, as we talked about a, a bit, that you know, we all filled out census forms this year, and no new life forms were discovered in <laughs> the United States. Uh, but 5,000 new species were discovered as a result of this marine uh, census. We have some video of some of this. So, what is so exciting about this? What are some of the craziest, you know, creatures that you discover? You mean in here in New York? <laughs> <laughs> On the subway? Yeah. Oh my goodness, uh, this. And this, I mean, there are thousands, you're right. I mean, that we, just because we decided 10 years ago with the launching of the census of marine life to try to figure out who our neighbors are, who lives here on this planet, who shares space with us here on Earth. Oh, this is a year of biodiversity, if you will, land and sea. It's staggering. We, we so far have enumerated on the land and in the ocean about one and a half million species of critters. But it's thought that this is an understatement, an underestimate, that it may be 10 times that. Some think there may be as many as 100 million little guys out there sharing space with us. If you count the microbes, maybe, and that would count microbes, but the number could be significantly greater. We just, we're just beginning to be awakened to the magnitude of the diversity of life and also our capacity to diminish it, to destroy it. When you destroy a coral reef, there are creatures there we haven't even discovered yet. Every reef has its own peculiar set of organisms. The deep reefs especially, because we, we haven't begun. But what is it, 5% of the ocean we've oh, seen, let alone yeah, explored? Yeah. So yeah. when we draw a trawl across the bottom or when we have a disaster, such as what we're now seeing yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico, what is being destroyed that we haven't even discovered? Like Yogi Berra said, if you, you could observe a lot just by watching, and uh, he, was, he was right about that, great scientist. Uh, there's a video, uh, 
A lot of stuff, you know, I talked about the deep ocean and all this fantastic stuff going on, but even in the shallow water, as Sylvia pointed out, some of these animals that live in the reefs uh, are just amazing. There's some amazing behavior. There's a clip of an octopus that done by my pal Roger Hanlon. Oh. And uh, I'll show you, you're going to see, uh, uh, there's a big white octopus in here <laughs> hiding in that big clump of stuff in the front or next to it. You'll see him maybe in a minute. Yep, there you go. Surprise. And isn't that amazing? No, that's, it's not make-believe. That's his eye right there. And then uh, he sees Roger, and off he goes. Big cloud of ink, and then he tries to bluff Roger. But not fooling Roger much, but makes himself very big. But watch, we're going to go backwards. And here's an animal. That, watch what he does with his skin in terms of texture and color. That nice big animal, to, that's his eye, to turn into that stuff on the left. So here he goes, slow motion reverse. Unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We, we can't do any better with CGI. No, we can't. So, so, and that just happened to be because Roger happened to be in the right spot at the right time and he caught that right behavior. And he's we? a cephalopod nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yep. There, tw someone tweet that out to Roger. <laughs> yeah. but actually, th but this is actually an important point about how the technology has really helped us because yep. some of the best dives in the submarine that I've had, well, they're all the best. I, since it's an addiction, it is. but we're just sitting in one place. Mm -hmm. Sylvia did it for 11 hours in Mexico as we're all yeah. waiting for her to come back. Is she, is she coming back? <laughs> I don't know. Never. But the idea is it's watching these animals do things like this, seeing them in their natural behavior. Because it isn't that long ago that the only way we'd know about octopus was to drag them up in a, tr in a research yeah. trawl, a dump them on bar. the deck, and try to fit all the pieces together. Yeah. This really is a revolution. And, you know, we are addicted in a way, but and we want to spread that. We want you to be too. And the first dive's free. You know, <laughs> we want you to. We, we want to bring you along. And, and you know, Sylvia's been part of that. Uh, we all have actually to try to bring the excitement of the undersea to you, especially using things like uh, internet and stuff like that. And uh, ah, there is a new tool that is really a cool tool, and that's called Google Earth. Yeah. Google Earth that now has an ocean. Yeah. <laughs> It didn't have an ocean Thanks, four <laughs> years ago. Now it has. It shows that wonderful topography. What did you used to call it? Google dirt. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's it's like the old the old 15th century maps. There be dragons here, right? Yes. Nobody yeah. cared about yeah. the, right. about right. what mm -hmm. laid beyond the border of the land. But but there, are, any of you now can go explore the ocean. There are places that you can see little video clips. National Geographic has embedded some. You can upload your photographs into. Google Earth and into the ocean to share the images such as the octopus show sure. and, and find it on, on Google Earth. There's one little clip of, of the Arctic. This is on Google Earth. If you go to the right place, you can find it. And the, if you pop on the latest version 5.0, it, it naturally comes up. You can go to the Arctic. Imagine, just imagine a spill like what we're seeing in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Arctic. How would you deal with that? We're having a tough enough time in the Gulf of Mexico. But what about the top of the world? This area that no one has yet accessed except in tiny little glimpses such as this. The Russians actually sent a submarine, two submarines, to the real North Pole in 2007, the first time anybody who's been to the real North Pole. Those are just tiny little glimpses. What we do know is that the Arctic, I call that a hope spot, like the Gulf of Mexico. It's an area that we should be going flat out to protect, as we did with Antarctica 50 years ago, to get nations to agree, to use our powers to not exploit it while we still have a chance, to hold off on drilling, hold off on exploiting the fish that people imagine to be there. We have one chance to get it right. It's on our watch that the decision will be made. <laughs> will there or will there not be drilling in the Arctic? Will there or will there not be spilling in the Arctic? I mean, it's up to us. And we were able to do that in the Antarctic. Yes. So far. Mm -hmm. So far. So far. But so it's on the edge, too. Right. A lot of things. You know, Ed Wilson last year, celebrating his 80th birthday here at this conference, 
made a comment when everybody was assembled outside, big crowds, and he made this wonderful little presentation. The one thing that really stuck with me, he said, we may be letting nature slip through our fingers. Just imagine that. On our watch, we're watching the degradation of our life support system. We're letting nature slip through our fingers. But when you really think about it, what we should be mightily concerned about is just the reverse. The tipping points, the points of no return, those last straw that'll break the camel's back. What is it that we're doing to nature? We should be really worried about nature letting us slip through her fingers. His life and, will go on, right? And, and what do you think it's going to take? I mean, if the Gulf spill isn't enough, I mean, it, it, <laughs> it just seems to be, you know, the human beings adapt so quickly to things for better and worse. You think, well, there used to be starfish here and they're not anymore, oh well. You know, people adapt to that. If a disaster like this isn't enough to, to, to wake people up and get them out of the mindset of, oh, well, the Arctic ice is melting, great, we can go drill there now. <laughs> right. uh, what is it gonna take well, to, well, to, to- I, I think this has made a difference. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is a, an incredible amount of anger and ironically, what we've talked about today has been a disaster of equal or even greater proportion than the oil spill. It's been a slow motion disaster in process 50 years. for 50 years. Yeah. Um, and we kind of failed to get the public sufficiently involved in the oceans. The oceans are out of sight and out of mind and from the surface, even with oil on top, it looks kind of nice. <laughs> Um, but, but now we do have an opportunity, I think, and right or wrong, it's here. And I think that this is where we all have to get more involved and more aware and more passionate because it, it goes beyond just education. Um, you know, people know not to smoke, but they still do, you know, <laughs> yes. um, and or wear seat belts and all of that. It's because we care so deeply, something has touched us at an emotional level that we act and we join organizations and we do things in our own life. And I think this, this is an opportunity to reach out in a passionate way to our neighbors and to our, our, our fellow citizens and, and, um, and learn from this lesson. I think it's possible. I, I think one of the, uh, the, the biggest fears I have as far as the oil spill itself is that people stop talking about it, even, even though we're gonna be suffering from it for the next decade or more. Um, one of the things we can do and one of the things that, that's hopeful is that people are talking about it and are unusually upset at this particular disaster, not that it's the only one, uh, but it's one that's been capturing everyone's minds and fears. The, you know, I, I grew up with a, a saying that my grandfather used to say all the time and that's people protect what they love. Uh, my father followed that up recently with how can people protect what they don't understand. Well, you know, out of sight, out of mind doesn't work anymore because luckily for us, technology has caught up to a point where all of us can be informed uh, and should be informed so that we can make better decisions in our everyday lives. And uh, I think that's, that's really one of the wonderful things. And we're the only creatures on the planet who can do that. Oh, you absolutely. Know, when you see all these poor creatures in the Gulf, they realize that there's trouble out there. They don't know why, <laughs> and they don't know what to do about it. You but know, we I, know if, why. I, I um, your friend said, if fish could scream, yes, uh, <laughs> yes. But, you know, we I would think very different. I want to follow up on that. You know, I. Chevy Chase. Um, <laughs> Chevy Chase says, if fish right? could scream, we'd think differently about them. <laughs> you know, I miss I miss your grandfather, and I miss having that sort of passion splash across my television screen every week. That was something, you know, amazingly powerful that we don't have today. When I go up to these schools around the country, 95% of kids, I take a hand poll, 95% of these kids are watching Deadliest Catch. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and about the same are watching Shark Week. They love the oceans, even the ones that have never seen an ocean, but they're as terrified as the ocean as they are in love with it. And I think a lot of this does have to do with the media that we are consuming as human beings. We have to see something that is a more realistic and positive and passionate voice for the oceans. Yep. 
I agree. I think nature's more exciting than the drama that they, they make up. It is. Oh, and like I, that octopus. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, do, so we, cool. we do worry that after the oil spill gets, you know, eventually the media's going to tire of it. Uh, it's perfect, you know, you've got a villain, BP, you've got the oil, which is ugly, you've got the oil-soaked birds, the, the, the impact on humanity. Uh, things like, from our everyday lives that are a threat to the sea, flame retardants that are in all these fabrics and in electronics and all this stuff, deadly, deadly stuff for the sea, plastics, deadly stuff for the sea. Comes back to us when we eat seafood. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we're in our own bodies. We're, we're seeing toxic yes, levels seriously. of herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, all the things that we do, you know, and it comes to the ocean in that beautiful crystal clear water that comes out of our fields and and uh, washes off of our farmlands and our, our backyards. Uh, that stuff brings death to the sea in some cases. And, but it's not an event, you know, there's no villain, it's everybody. So there are certain things that we're gonna have to, we need to take a deep breath, not panic, and get, on, get some leadership and get on a course of action. And I think what we find is that the, a lot of the little things got us in this trouble that we started to do it. Maybe a lot of the little things that we pull together will get us out of it in the long run. Well, I was reading, there was a report in May from NOAA, the fisheries service, that said four fishing stocks, including the Atlantic swordfish, have been rebuilt. Oh, you, that was not from the fish. They didn't ask the fish. <laughs> I knew there was gonna be. Uh, that is. You pushed that button. Uh, well, <laughs> go yell at your friends at NOAA. I'm just uh, I'm the messenger. But it, so obviously this is not as satisfactory. It's not what no. it was. I mean, but is there anything that works? What is the strategy that seems to work best when it comes value to value fish alive, and understand how much they contribute to making the, the planet work? We no longer consume songbirds. We don't eat eagles and owls commercially. Maybe somebody does once in a while. But to continue to extract huge quantities, especially of the carnivores, that's most of what we take out of the sea. It takes, you know, we eat low on the food chain when it comes to what we raise. Cows, chickens, pigs, whatever. And they're fast growing. Most of them come to market within a year, maybe two years. But not 10 years, or not 100. 50 or 100 years. And a tuna takes six years to mature. Six years, you don't eat six-year-old chickens <laughs> or cows, or most people don't. And it, it wouldn't be efficient or effective, but because we regard the ocean as a source of free goods, we discount the value. And we have stripped the ocean of things that are not quickly replace, replaced. And well, the, other, the other problem with those numbers is the way we manage fish stocks. We don't it, manage fish stocks. Or, excuse me. <laughs> the way we mismanage fish stocks ourselves <laughs> is it, it, we take the perception that fish are just crops that yeah. grow in the sea like corn and we harvest them. And that's how they're managed, stock by stock. But fish are actually part of that ecosystem. They're not separate. Mm. They have jobs to do. We've seen groupers in the Gulf of Mexico that dig these enormous holes. Mm -hmm. It looks like the surface of the moon. The engineer and groupers. They're, they're, they're <laughs> ecosystem engineers. They build this incredible structure. It attracts other fish and they eat them. It's a very <laughs> good strategy. But all these other fish, all these other components of the ecosystem depend on the grouper. Um, so we have to manage them, our fisheries, as, as if we're looking at the entire ecosystem, not treating these animals as crops that are separate from the ecosystem. Well, the sharks are the garbage cleaners of the ocean. Uh, turtles are the gardeners of those little seabeds. Um, you know, if you give nature a break, it has a tendency to heal itself, but we have to give nature a break. If, if you ever get yeah. a chance to go to places like uh, the Poor Knights National Marine Sanctuary out in, um, in New Zealand, or, or Flower Garden Bank, some of the, the national marine sanctuaries, especially the, uh, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Uh, it, you can see what life is supposed to be like, especially if you, if you give it a break and if you leave it alone. And, and I think- uh, you're, Coast you're, of Cuba. Yeah, yeah Cuba, Cuba yeah. exactly. And I think the really good news is we still have about 10% of the tunas remaining <laughs> and about 10% of the sharks. They're not all gone yet. But if we continue business as usual, appetites as usual, not thinking about the real cost of what we consume, wildlife from the sea, 
the projections are that by the middle of this century, there won't be commercial fishing. What, right now we could choose to back off, give fish a chance, give the ocean a break, give, give time and, and to recover from disasters such as what we've been doing for 50 years, but this immediate crisis in the Gulf. And, and, I, and I think one, but it's, it's too sorry. late for some things. Like there was a monk seal that lived in the Gulf of Mexico that came as far north as Galveston as recently as 1952. That's when the last one was seen. There used to be seals in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Caribbean. I didn't know that as a kid. I grew up along the shores of the Gulf of Mexico. Wrote my dissertation on the seaweeds in the Gulf of Mexico. I didn't know there were seals out there. The way there are still a few in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, there's still a few in the Mediterranean. Not too many. We still have a chance with them. We don't have a chance with monk seals anymore in the Gulf. But we still have a chance with grouper. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though the Nassau grouper is now an endangered species, if we stop killing them, stop eating and give up your grouper sandwich for, you know, <laughs> 10 years, yeah. maybe we'll have them in the future. But well, if we the, keep the, doing what we're doing now, there's no Yeah, the, the power really is in our wallets uh, or our purses. Uh, we can make good Remote. choices, and there's nothing more powerful than that choice <laughs> at, the, at your grocer or at the, at the restaurant to eat sustainably. Uh, or, or, you know, close to <laughs> what we hope sustainable is. Uh, but it's hard. It's really confusing out there. This is one area where we desperately need better education and, and better information because not only is it hard to do the right thing, you go into the store or a restaurant and the chef might not even know what ocean that salmon came from, if it or, came or from an ocean at all. at all. Yeah, right. <laughs> or, right. What kind of fish is right. it? I mean, there are 20,000 different kinds of fish, and you get a, a fish sandwich, you get catch of the day, you get fish and chips, you don't get a mammal burger, or maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> a Kentucky yeah. fried bird. You know, a lot of terrestrial <laughs> conservationists, um, you know, think ecotourism is a, is a remedy in some ways, you know, convincing people in Madagascar that the lemur is more valuable alive in the tree yes. than dead in the pot. Yeah. Is aquatourism ever going to happen? It's How, happening already. Is it? How? With yeah. whale sharks? You, you gave an example. Yeah. Right. Uh, that those whale sharks bring about, I don't know, they, there was a market in Taiwan, about $5,000 for one whale shark right. that was served by shark fins and the meat. Bait is sometimes the destiny of, of sharks, but whatever. Um, or that's once. Or you can use that same animal for 30 or 40 years over many, many seasons for many fishermen making a living by encouraging the likes of me, I will go and pay good money for the privilege of being with that animal. But that's one very slow, lovable guy. What about swordfish? What about tuna? How do we, you know, how do you do the same thing for those? I think once stops? you've seen that ocean film and realize how magnificent those creatures are, or if you talk to MIT engineers, who are trying to capture the essence of what a, how does a tuna move through the ocean? Robo tuna. Uh -huh. They've done robo uh, mm -hmm. lobster. How does a lobster articulate its, then lots of clever minds trying to duplicate what it's taken hundreds of millions of years of fine tuning to achieve. We can learn from them if we don't destroy the source. I mean, the tuna, as it swishes its tail back and forth, and this is true of the blue fins, but others as well, they capture on the order of 97% of the energy generated. Little whirlpools are generated. They're the cheetahs of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. yeah the acceleration is amazing. And, and, the, you know, and we can't do that with our best technologies for, for submarines. For ecotourism to work, it also has to benefit the community, the, the, the local people where those resources are. And there are a lot of multinational companies out there doing what they call ecotourism. And I've seen it up close and personal in, in uh, Trinidad, Tobago. A large hotel comes into a community, makes a lot of promises, kicks everybody out, closes off the beach, and hires, imports their own workers. So it just happened and, in Bimini, too. Yeah, and these are uh, the all-in-one resorts, so people don't leave, and they, they don't go out into the community to eat. So it's, it's become an empty promise in many places. But on the other hand, 
if done right, it can be absolutely transformational. The, the small scale examples in, in Western Cuba, these turtles that I'm quite worried about right now because of the oil spill, um, the Cubans, because things, um, you know, day to day life is tough, they would regularly eat the adult uh, turtles that, that came ashore to nest. And working with the University of Havana, which brought out food supplies and, and funding and helped get them involved in a project. There's now a 13-year-old project out on the western tip of Cuba protecting these sea turtles, getting the local community involved, and bringing tourists in and charging them some good money to go see these turtles. There's alive. another angle about the value. I mean, what's your life worth anyway? You have to take care of the ocean because it takes care of us. You know, we, we offer carbon credits for forests because we appreciate that rainforests and other places on the land that we can see and we can see the carbon locked up in trees. Every fish is a carbon-based unit. The water column is filled with carbon-based units. Every microbe is one as well. Plankton, all this life in the sea from the surface all the way to, to the bottom. If we really want to get serious about why does the ocean matter? Think about what life itself uh -huh. is worth and protect and maybe give carbon credits for not killing the fish because they store carbon and when they die naturally goes to the bottom. It's sequestered naturally into the great depths of the sea. Not released in, when we take, as we are now, 100 million tons or so, plus or minus, depending on how much bycatch you take into account, out of the ocean, it ultimately goes up into the atmosphere. Leave it in the ocean, well, some of it goes to the atmosphere, but most of it stays into the sea. And, and there's another kind of tourism, and, and uh, Sylvia alluded to it in the beginning, is that you know when we go uh, in the submarine to the deep ocean, I'm going to go back to the deep again. Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> it was just those three people in the sub looking out the portholes that have that wonderful experience, and I could tell you about it or share some stories, maybe show you some video, but you're removed from that experience, the experience. Uh, along came robots in the mid-80s, and now uh, the robot was tethered to the surface ship and with a satellite link. Uh, you could, where you're sitting there today, with a joystick on that screen, drive a robot around the Titanic or wherever you want. Uh, that, that technology exists. It's expensive, but you can do it. What we started to notice was that the video game industry, uh, you know, watching kids, that, and my kids, they put on a headset, turn on a TV set, and they're instantly connected with a global community of of people that are ex having a, the same experience at the same time. In some games, you're actually exploring lands, collecting water, looking at rocks, and all those stuff. Uh, these massive games. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're looking at is putting the right kinds of sensors together, the robots, the cameras, the sonar, so that you start to build up this enhanced virtual reality so that you can then, and we're looking at Titanic as one example of that. If we can raise Titanic virtually by doing the right kinds of collecting of the information and enhance it in certain ways with real-time information, then you can have that same experience of exploring around a wreck like that on your own mm -hmm. uh, and, and have that kind of experience. Can you, yeah. can you breathe virtual air? Well, that's the problem. You know, someone, said, someone once said, you know, you can't surprise a robot. And, and uh, so you can't exactly experience the really being there, but we can come close to having you get, get the idea of exploring uh, through that kind of and, sense. I mean, being an, uh, uh, even if you don't have an affinity for diving or, or, or going into a, or the capabilities of going into a sub, you can always be a, an armchair explorer and yep. use all these new technologies, uh, including, of course, Google Oceans and, and what you're talking about, yep. David, and uh, getting access to all this beauty and this information and spreading it through social media and really becoming, uh, in, a, in a sense, the advocates to, to becoming better stewards and saving our planet. You're not the audience here. You are ambassadors to an audience who stands a lot to be hearing some of these messages. You know, I, I visited uh, Elkhart, Indiana on my 50 state tour in October. One of the communities hardest hit by the economy. They build RVs there. Uh, enough said about that. Um, but also that was the home of Miles Laboratory in Alka-Seltzer. And that whole, uh, that whole industry left and went overseas. 20% unemployment, and uh, the president was there using, using that backdrop. What I was so impressed by there, this was a, a community that had a lot of scientists in it because of Miles Laboratory. Even when things were so awful, they pulled together every year 
and they do this incredible community event for science. And thousands of kids are there. And the thing that makes the difference is the human connection. They're feeling the passion directly from the scientists in that community, from the, from the people there. And kids around the country aren't getting that. They are not able to connect and get that human connection to people who really are in turn connected to the environment or to the laboratory or to an operating room or whatever it might be. I think, uh, you know, picking up on Fabian's comment, y you could really make a difference just by making that connection yourselves in your communities and, and with your schools. I mean, we're all on Facebook and Twitter and all that. Send us an email. Send us yeah. a text. <laughs> you have all been deputized. We are out of time. Yes. But uh, thank you all for coming. And one more round of applause for our panel.